I'd invite you this evening to turn to Psalm 17, the next song in Israel's songbook as we're studying these together. Our plan is to work our way psalm by psalm up to Psalm 50, for now at least, in our time together on Sunday nights. In most of life, we just sort of walk through from situation to situation, from day to day, rather independently. I'm not sure that we live the lives of faith normally, naturally, the way that we do when we're pressed by trials. We look at problems and we bring about solutions. We consider the resources at our disposal and we apply them to our situations. How often do we look up? How often do we go down on our knees? Hard trials expose a reality for us that we are actually always in need. That we ought to be as desperate in the normal everyday occurrences of life as we find ourselves to be desperate in times of severe trials. Psalm 17 presents a severe trial for David and he has written out his prayer for us. Let's read it together. Psalm 17. A prayer of David. Hear a righteous cause, O Yahweh. Give heed to my cry of lamentation. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. May my judgment come from your presence. May your eyes behold what is upright. You have tested my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tried me, and you find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. As for the deeds of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept from the paths of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My footsteps have not stumbled. I have called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my speech. Marvelously show your loving kindness, O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand, from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who devastate me, my deadly enemies who surround me. They have closed their unfeeling heart. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. He is like a lion that is eager to tear, and as a young lion lurking in hidden places. Arise, O Yahweh, confront him, bring him low. Protect my soul from the wicked with your sword, from men with your hand, O Yahweh, from men of the world whose portion is in this life and whose belly you fill with your treasure. They are satisfied with children and leave their excess to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. There is no specific situation given for the writing of this psalm. David is in extremity. He has no hope but Yahweh, but we don't know the specifics of his situation. It is an impossible situation he is in, humanly speaking, requiring extraordinary divine interference. This is called a prayer of David. We see that in the first verse. The prayer of David is actually part of the Hebrew text. And it's a word that's used for several psalms in the psalm book, listed as a prayer. It's placed in the song book of Israel, whether David himself put lyrics to it or intended instruments to be played alongside of it. Well, he wrote the lyrics. Whether he wrote a melody for it, we do not know. Um, Perhaps someone put this to music at a later date. But it is in the song book for Israel. It is in the song book for us. And we follow along with David's prayer. This is a prayer for help against the relentless onslaught of persistent enemies. David has found himself surrounded by enemies who will not let him go. And they persist until he is ruined. That is their aim. And David finds himself hemmed in with nowhere to go but to look for help from Yahweh. And that is exactly what he does. We'll look at this psalm in its five elements. The first element is a plaintive petition. David here is appealing to Yahweh. He is asking for help in the first two verses. 
He says, hear a righteous cause, O Yahweh. Give heed to my cry of lamentation. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. David's response to the trouble he is in is not to grin and bear it. It is not to rely on self-sufficient strategies to get himself out of trouble, but he turns to prayer. That is what we ought to do. It is so easy for us to depend on our own resources, to think we have the answers, to begin to come up with manipulations or machinations to get ourselves out of troubles. But David turns to the Lord. John Calvin, commenting on this verse, says, When we neglect prayer, we are defrauding God of the honor which belongs to Him, in not referring our cause to Him, and in not leaving to Him to judge and to determine the outcome. God is actually pleased when we come to Him in our troubles, and we look to Him for help. To fail to pray in such instances defrauds God of the honor. This prayer is urgent on David's lips. Three parallel statements in the first verse indicate this. Hear a righteous cause, give heed to my cry of lamentation, give ear to my prayer. Back to back to back statements, David is pleading. And he pleads what he calls here a righteous cause. And of course we know it is better to suffer for doing what is right than to suffer the consequences of wrongdoing. And it is in the heart of God to come to defense of his people when they are in trouble. David here claims to be innocent in the matter. His innocence is not absolute. David is not claiming to be righteous in some sort of absolute sense as if he'd never sinned. But in the matter in which he is being pursued by his enemies, David calls this a just cause. And he says he prays not from hypocrisy, not from lying lips or deceitful lips. That is, David is sincere in his prayer. His prayer is not empty religious pretense. He's not going through the motions. He is actually appealing to God sincerely in a relationship to Yahweh. And he's not holding on to something that displeases God with one hand while begging God for favors with the other. His prayer is not hypocritical. David is not sinless, but he is faithful. And look at verse 2. May my judgment come from your presence. May your eyes behold what is upright. This is a remarkable statement. David, who is a sinner but who trusts in Yahweh, is looking not to other sinners for help or comfort or people who could really understand him. He looks to the sinless one, the holy one, the one whose standard is absolute righteousness, and he calls out to God for help. David prefers to have God as his judge. His appeal in verse 2 is, Oh, Lord, let my judgment come from your face, from your presence. That is a remarkably bold request. He goes on to say, Your eyes will behold with equity. Uh, some English translations say, may your eyes behold what is right. I think David here is affirming, God, you will behold what is right. You will see things accurately. And so I want the scrutiny of your judgment on my life. This is a good thing to ask that God would be our judge because he alone sees with equity. He alone sees with an absolute righteous lens. And yet that's a terrifying thing for any sinner to ask that God would be his judge. David affirms that God will do what is right. And I think even if that means some sort of consequence to David, God would be preferred as judge. Now, this kind of confidence could never come from someone who is depending on his own righteousness. Defend me, God, because I'm always right in everything I've ever done. I've never sinned. Such an arrogant boast before the Lord would not bring divine favor, but would bring more condemnation. If your only hope is your own righteousness, this is a bad move to appeal to God. But if you have trusted God on the basis of faith, 
for a righteousness that is not your own, a righteousness that comes from faith, the the kind of faith righteousness described in the Old Testament in Genesis 12 with Abraham and Genesis 15 with Abraham, and the kind of faith righteousness the New Testament describes in the gospel. It is a faith that believes that Yahweh, the perfectly righteous one, provides a righteousness for those who believe. A forgiven sinner seeking to track God by faith will find God to be a good advocate. This is what Paul says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who against us? Who could possibly be against us? If God, the one who sees all your sins and knows all your motives and on the basis of the gospel of grace has forgiven your sins, if that God has decided to be for you, Who could possibly stand against? Who could walk into God's courtroom and leverage anything against you? Our advocate, Jesus the righteous, stands in our stead. Think about David the sinner in 1 Chronicles 21. He took a census of the nation. This was a sin against God. It displeased God. It displayed a lack of trust in God's provision and protection of the nation. And in 1 Chronicles 21, David's advisor came to him and said, don't take a census. This would be a horrible thing to do. Don't do it, David. Three times he came to him and said, don't do it. And David did it anyway. The text tells us that it was even Satan who incited David to sin against the Lord in taking this census of the nation. And when David was addressed by God's prophet, Three options for consequences were given him, a sort of choose your own adventure. And David said in 1 Chronicles 21, 13, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of Yahweh, for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. What is David saying? God, the absolute righteous judge who has set his affections on sinners like David would be the one David would appeal to. Now, David's sin had painful consequences, and yet God relented and had mercy so that those consequences didn't even go as far as they could have gone. And David makes an appeal on the basis of Yahweh's covenant love, on the basis of Yahweh's mercy, that he would fall into the the hands of Yahweh instead of the hands of man. That tells us something about what David knows about human nature. When we puny humans who are sinners are offended, sometimes we can go without mercy. We can seek out retribution and vengeance in a way that God does not. Even when David's sin was in view, he still preferred God to be his judge. And so David opens his life to the scrutiny of God in this prayer. Your eyes behold what is just, what is right. David here, for all the personal knowledge of his own sin, is not afraid to leave that open and bare before the Lord. David said to his own son Solomon in 1 Chronicles 28.9, Yahweh searches all hearts and he understands every intent of the thoughts. If David's heart and life were an open book before the Lord, what would the Lord find? What would God see? And David here invites God's testing and refinement. It leads to the second element of this prayer. The second element beginning in verse 3 is divine evaluation. Divine evaluation. Look down at verse 3. David says, you have tested my heart, you have visited me by night, you've tried me and you find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. This indicates a sleepless night in prayer, a a night spent in self-examination and divine scrutiny. Three words lead off this section, tested, visited, and tried. The word tested is used of trying gold by fire. The word for visited is is properly translated in investigation and tried as the testing and refining process. And so David in this night of prayer expresses a concern for his own spiritual condition. 
He is before the Lord when no one else is around, when it is dark and quiet, when he's left alone with his own thoughts and his heart and mind are an open book before God, and he is introspective. He is contemplative. He is eager for God to get to the bottom of things. And he says here in this examination at night that God finds nothing. And I don't believe that David is here saying there was nothing for God to see. There was no dross to refine. There was nothing to be tested, nothing to be melted down and purified. Quite the contrary. I believe what was discovered here is that David, though not sinless, was not loving his sin. He was not loyal to his sin. There was nothing in David that he was unwilling to let go. He was, in fact, eager to be refined. In fact, one of the great benefits of an external trial is the internal purification that comes with it. When you are hard-pressed by external pressures... It is a great opportunity to spend a sleepless night in self-examination. Oh, Lord, what do you see in my heart? What do you see there? What needs to be refined? What needs to be purified? It is a wonderful opportunity for dependence, for the removal of the dross. And notice David's recognition of the condition of his own heart. He says, I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. What does that imply? that there are things that stir up in David's heart that must be checked at the lips. I'm not going to let out of my mouth the tendencies of my own heart, the, the temptations that are there in my own heart. And he says, I have purposed in these things. As we find out later in the psalm, David's context here is enemies who have waged open war against David. And, and even against his enemies, David recognizes it is not okay to sin in your dealings, to sin in your speech, to sin against those who sin against you. David has purposed in his heart not to respond in kind, to have no vengeance, to not justify bad behavior because of what someone else did. Speaking of the mouth and transgression that so easily comes, Charles Spurgeon said, Lion taming and serpent charming are not to be mentioned in the same day as tongue taming. And people can tame lions, people can charm snakes, but as James said, no man can tame the tongue. Spurgeon recognized, and I believe David recognizes here, the, the danger of sinful speech under external pressures. And so we notice here in David's prayer, a prayer for help, for radical Godward focus. He's expressing an eagerness to not sin. And not simply a plea from rescue from difficulty. David's pressed in on all sides from enemies who want his ruin. And he could simply pray, help, get me out of this mess. And what is David saying here? Try me, O God, examine my heart, remove the dross, and don't let me sin. It's a wonderful example for us. Look at verse 4. As for the deeds of men, by the word of your lips I have kept from the paths of the violent. How did David keep from behaving like those who opposed him? How did he refrain his mouth the word violent here is a word used for robbers and murderers and those who do intentional violence. And David answers that question with the phrase, by the word of your lips. The word of God is what helped David restrain himself. That is a life patterned after God's word, a life governed by God's word. And let me just remind us that if we are not regularly taking in God's word, we will quickly and easily resort to human strategies, to fleshly thinking, to what just comes natural to us. God's ways are not our ways. They are higher than our ways. They are counterintuitive to the ways of natural man. And if you and I are to walk in God's tracks, if we are to walk in God's ways, particularly in our responses to difficulties, then we must put ourselves under the Word of God. 
If we are to not respond with evil for evil, if when provoked we give no return, we must think God's thoughts. We must hear God's words. We must meditate on God's words. And this requires regular refreshment. We may think that we know what those passages say. We may think, oh yeah, I've read those verses before. We need to go back and read them again to refresh our hearts on God's ways of thinking. If we do not do that, we get stale. So how does God's word help in our response to enemies? First of all, by commands. God gives explicit commands about how to respond when we are threatened, how to, how to respond when we are provoked. He, he tells us what to do in love. And then by prohibitions, God tells us what to not do. He tells us how to not respond. And then by examples, and God's word is full of examples. Joseph and Daniel and Stephen and Paul and, of course, our Lord Jesus. How were they responding when they were mistreated? Examples for us in God's word. And then God's word gives us promises. Promises for fatherly care and timely justice. Remember this, Christian, that God loves you and cares for you as a father. And remember that he will vindicate his own name. And in vindicating his own name, in the final reckoning of things, he will vindicate his people. We can trust in his timely justice. And I think the other big help for us in God's word is the gospel itself. Remember, Christian, what you deserve and remember what you get instead. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are not treated as your sins deserve. You are actually rather treated as if you had always done everything right to please the Lord and you had never done anything wrong to displease him. You are treated as God would treat his own perfect son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the great exchange of his righteousness for our sins, in the cross, he took what we deserve and gives us what we do not deserve. To remember that helps us in our mistreatments. And then look at verse 5. My steps have held fast to your paths. My footsteps have not stumbled. Verse 5 actually completes the thought of verse 4. I have kept from the paths of the violent... And then it's not even a complete sentence in verse 5. And the idea is, I've kept my feet from the paths of the violent by making my steps grasp onto your tracks. It's a very vivid illustration in the Hebrew. God has these tracks, sort of deep ruts or entrenchments, a well-worn path that he has driven. And David, the psalmist, says, and I've clinging on to those things. I've made my feet grasp onto your tracks. I've always been fascinated by those high rail trucks. I don't know if you've seen those. It's like a pickup truck, but it has railroad wheels on it. You see it driving down the highway, and then all of a sudden you see it on the railway. They're called high rail trucks because they're highway, railway, pickup trucks. And they're used by the railroads to bring supplies, to bring repairs, to bring workmen up and down the rails. They are dual-mode work trucks. And the great thing about those is you don't have to steer them because they just follow the tracks. Those metal wheels fold down and then grip onto the railroad tracks and they are secure and they go wherever the tracks tell them to go. They're locked into the rails. And David here in verse 5 says, My steps have held fast to your tracks. David describes his own steps as being locked into God's rails. And he says, Doing that, my feet will never be shaken. He will not stumble, he'll stay on course. And then look at verse 6 I have called upon you, and you will answer me, O God. This is confidence in prayer. David recognizes the temptations and the tendencies of his own heart. He has asked God for help, and he has seen God answer. Consider Jesus' example in this. Jesus, of course, is better than David in this. 
1 Peter 2.23 says, While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's David's sentiment here. David did it imperfectly. Jesus did it perfectly. What would be the results of a life lived this way? What if God's kindness, he brought into your life enemies of the gospel, people who hated Jesus, who decided they didn't like you because of Jesus? And what if they surrounded you? And what if they made it their aim to ruin your life? What could God accomplish if you lived out David's perspective from this psalm? Or Jesus' perspective from 1 Peter 2, 23? What are the results of a life lived, governed by God's word in the face of enemies? In 1703, a French Roman Catholic, a man by the name of Bion, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right in French, it's probably something like Bion. Bion. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to write that down. Bien. He had the regrettable job of being a chaplain for the prisoner slaves aboard a galley ship. Many of the slaves were Huguenots. These were French Protestants who believed the gospel and they wouldn't turn back from Christ despite the confiscation of their property, the loss of loved ones, physical torture, and finally receiving the death sentence the death sentence to be carried out by being chained to their oars in a warship until that boat was destroyed and sunk. Bion, the Catholic chaplain on the ship, reports that the prisoners aboard ship who refused to kneel and who refused to remove their caps during the Catholic mass were stretched across a cannon and beaten by a strong man with a rope full of knots and a whip. And to quote Bion, they were beaten until the skin came off their backs and shoulders. Afterwards, vinegar and salt were poured into the wounds, and the victim was taken to the prow room. That's the front compartment of the ship, where they were infested by vermin and suffocated. Most people preferred to die at the oars rather than to be taken to the prow room. You think about this. Roman Catholic chaplain aboard this death ship crewed by Protestants who were suffering for the gospel, Huguenots. What a job. His task was to convert them to Catholicism before they died. Bion, who later became a believer, wrote this. It is true that at the sight of the sad state of their bodies, I shed tears. They noticed it. And although they could scarcely utter a word being nearer death than life, they told me that they were thankful to me for the sweetness that I had had for them. I went for the purpose of consoling them, but I had more need of consolation than they. For God, who was their stay, armed them with a truly Christian constancy and patience. You never heard them, among the cries which cannot be refused to nature, offer one word of impatience or injury. God, the Eternal One, was their comfort, and the only one whom they called upon for help. I had occasion to visit them every day, and at the sight of their patience and the last of their miseries, my heart would reproach myself for my hardness and my stubbornness at remaining in a religion in which for a long time I had noticed many errors, and especially had noticed a cruelty which is the character opposite to the church of Jesus Christ. Finally, their wounds were so many mouths which announced to me the reformed religion, and their blood was for me a seed of regeneration." This Roman Catholic chaplain on a death ship got saved because of the way that Christians suffered. It's remarkable. David moves to a third element in this prayer, a covenant appeal. Here, David leans in on the covenant promises that God had made to his people. Look at the second part of verse 6. Incline your ear to me, hear my speech... And now David is making a plea to a friend and protector on the basis of covenant. 
And he says in verse 7, marvelously show your loving kindnesses, O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand, from those who rise up against. In verse 7, he says, cause to be extraordinary your grace. He paints the picture of a severe situation that David felt himself to be in. He knew he needed something remarkable, some marvelous outpouring of help, some supernatural intervention. There was no human agency to get him out of this mess. And he appeals to God's loving kindness. That's the Old Testament word for grace, for God's covenant love, Yahweh's loyalty to the people that he had chosen for his own possession. And notice David's title for God here. O oh, Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand. What a great title for God. And David is seeking refuge from the ones rising up against. Look in verse 8. He says, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. These are two heart-strengthening pictures of God's loyal love for his people. The first, the apple of the eye, is literally the middle of the daughter of the eye. Is the Hebrew way of speaking of the pupil. That eye is that most precious organ, most protected by the, the bones of the skull, protected even by the, the hair around it. It's so important you can't get things in it. Things in the eye are a severe irritant, and, and the pupil, particularly right at the center, must be protected. The pupil is significant to the owner. It's precious and valuable. And, and David appeals to God's valuation of his people. And then he speaks of the shadow of the wings. This seems to be a phrase coined by David himself. These are the wings of a large bird. In the Old Testament, the, the picture of, of the, the wings of a bird is often the picture of the eagle or the vulture, a, a large soaring bird with colossal wings, and the mother bird protecting her brood with those giant wings. And the shadow of those large wings would be a place of protection from enemies and a shady comfort from the blazing sun. And these two pictures combine to illustrate God's love and care for his own God's people are of a special interest to him. He loves and cares for them, and he is provoked to tender and powerful attention when they're in need. Look at verse 9. From the wicked who devastate me. This, this leads to an extended description of the enemies David is under. This is a window into David, what David was facing. The fourth element of this prayer is this extensive description of the enemies. Beginning in verse 9, these, these ones who devastate, he says, their purpose is to deal violently with him until he is ruined. And, and he calls them my deadly enemies in verse 9. This translates a Hebrew phrase, the ones who are hostile to me, to the very soul of me. That is, they will not quit, they will not rest until their prey is ruined and dead and gone. David says they surround. David is hemmed in. Notice in verse 10, they have closed their unfeeling heart. Literally, they are shut up in fat. Uh, thinking about the, the fat that surrounds the internal organs has rendered them insensitive and calloused and unfeeling. This is, as one commentator has called it, a fortified indifference. They don't care how David is suffering. In their luxury, their gluttony, their pride, their self-satisfaction, they have grown a lack of mercy, a lack of compassion. Charles Spurgeon said, their full bellies have made empty hearts. They are heartless. Their humanity has evaporated. They are unmoved by the pitiable state of a fellow human being. And look down at verse 11. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. David is using plural pronouns here. He includes his companions, and the enemies have surrounded them like a pack of hungry wolves. David and his friends can't go left. They can't go right. They can't go forward. They can't go backward. There is no escape for them except God intervenes. 
And these enemies have set their eyes, that is, they have fixated. All their ingenuity, all their resources are spent now on destroying a life. And look at verse 12. The enemy is like a lion eager to tear, and as a young lion lurking in hidden places. These enemies have an appetite for destruction. Lurking in hiding places means they are skilled at deceit and at strategies to overthrow. In verse 13, David appeals again, Arise, O Yahweh, confront him, bring him low, protect my soul from the wicked with your sword. In the midst of this extensive description of his enemies, David restates his plea for help. And it's a good plea. If Yahweh rises up, who could stand? No enemy. And the request here is that Yahweh would confront them. Literally, meet the enemy face to face. And David says, bring him low. Cause him to bow down. And we have a promise in the New Testament that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Satan himself will bow. And in the meantime, there is a sense in which every enemy of the Christian bows now. And I mean this in the Romans 8, 28 sense. You know that verse, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. What kind of power God must have to force your enemies, Christian, to serve as your friend? That is, to bring about their good. They mean it for evil, God intends it for your good. A remarkable power that even before the final day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, those who set themselves out as the enemy of the Christian are actually serving the Christian for his good. This is God's power. This is God's lordship. And when the enemies are working for your good, they are doing so because God is stronger and because God loves you. And David appeals to the sword of Yahweh. That, of course, is better than any human means of rescue. The description of the enemies continues in verse 14. They are men. That is, mere men. That's a helpful reminder. They are men of the world, he says. They are worldly men. And, and here it is they. There are now multiple enemies on David's lips, but they are temporary men. They are temporal minded. Notice David says their portion is in this life here only. They're having their best life now. Their only hope is in this life. Their only joys are in this life. And all those joys are, of course, unsatisfactory and fleeting. Notice they have their bellies filled, verse 14. What are their bellies full of? God's treasure. God has been kind and gracious and merciful, not yet giving them what they deserve. He, he gives them good gifts. And God's good gifts could be received with gratitude. They could be enjoyed as worship. And I think David would be happy for them. He could rejoice with them in their joy at receiving good gifts from God's bounty. They have children, and they have excess to leave to their children. They, they have piled up wealth to give as an inheritance. But these enemies are not Godward. They are not grateful. They have loved the gifts and rejected the giver. They worship the created thing rather than the creator. They seem to lack nothing in this life but grace but as Charles Spurgeon has commented, the lack of gospel grace spoils everything. The best gifts given by God when not received with gratitude by a heart of faith, when not enjoyed as a matter of worship of the giver of all good gifts, will only be moth-eaten and rusted waste. The encouragement for us is to not envy them. And there doesn't seem to be a hint of envy in David here. He doesn't say, I wish I had a full belly. I believe David sees their best life for what it really is, a prelude to judgment. The New Testament describes such men this way, Philippians 3.19, their end is destruction, their God is their appetite. 
Their glory is their shame, and they set their minds on earthly things. How sad must the portion of these enemies of David be if their consuming occupation is the ruin of another man's life? And while this present world was everything to David's enemies, Yahweh was everything to David. Look down at verse 15. This gives us our last element in this prayer, and that element is resurrection hope. This is one of those wonderful places in the Old Testament where we realize, hey, the Old Testament people knew a lot more than we give them credit for. As for me, David says, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. Again, there's no complaint on David's lips about the good life his enemies seem to be enjoying and he's missing out on. David's treasure vastly outpaces theirs. When he says awake here, he's not talking about Tuesday morning, uh, another day to, to try again to get along under difficulty. David is talking about the next life. The sleep here is the sleep of physical death, and the hope of David is the hope of resurrection and the enjoyment of the very presence of God when he awakes. You and I do not assess divine favor by the accumulation of material possessions. We assess divine favor by the grace of the gospel. If God has looked on us in kindness and given us a citizenship in heaven, we have everything and we are infinitely wealthy despite our present circumstances. Think back to Philippians 3. I read verse 19 a moment ago. Their end is destruction, these worldly men. Their God is their appetite. Their glory is in their shame. They set their mind on earthly things. And then a contrast in Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, with the exertion of the power that he possesses, even to subject all things to himself. Jesus has power to make Satan bow the knee, and with that power, he will transform this body of humiliation that we live in now into a body in conformity with his own resurrection glory. It's coming. John Calvin said, the empty joys of this world only famish the soul, all while they sharpen and increase the appetite in order to show that, the, that those only are partakers of true and substantial happiness who seek their happiness in the enjoyment of God. Why does the world run on the hamster wheel searching for delight and never get anywhere in it? Always exchanging one gift from the giver for another, for another, for another, trying to find joy, satisfaction, and happiness, never looking up, never finding joy in him, and always being left frustrated and empty. Because the only way you get happiness is to find it in God alone. A couple things for us to think about from this psalm. Trust God in your sufferings here. Trust Him. Resolve not to sin in the style of your enemies. Close your eyes when it's time to leave this vaporous life. Do that with joy. Wake up in God's presence to an endless life filled by unquenchable joy. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this prayer song. We thank you for the truths that David knew the hope that David prayed, the example that David gave, that in a very real sense, with Old Testament words, he said, take the world, but give me Jesus. Now, those enemies of mine that have all the stuff of this world are temporally minded, but I have you, and that's good enough more than good enough. That is the source of unstoppable, unquenchable, unending joy.
We pray that that would be our heart too in Jesus' name. Amen.